Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Yanni. Like, to me, being on the stage, being introduced by you is like a dream coming true. Like, to me, now being introduced by Yanni is like I can tick off from the bucket list. I'm done talking, I can just walk up stage. <laughs> no, I'm joking, of course. Uh, today, I'm going to try to navigate with you what has been happening in the React Native world. Um, as you may know, this title is quite uh, generic, it doesn't really tell much. And not only that, it's also fake, because the real title is past, future, and present. And now you maybe start wondering, why did you waste the whole slide with the wrong title? And well, that's simply because I want to drive home the point that I'm going to try to go further on during the talk, which is that change is good. And by change is good, I mean any change that it is not Brexit. <laughs> this idea of change is good actually came to me when I was preparing these slides, because I've given variation of this talk already a couple times during this past year, and every single time, uh, not only the re-architecture has changed something, so every time it was a completely different talk, but also I was a completely, quote-unquote, different person back then. So like the first time in January, I was on, only a React Native core maintainer, I was working hard on the releases, as Yanni mentioned, but then by May, I sort of became m way more involved in what is now the React Native community 2.0, and I was an owner, I thought we were going to change the world. And now I'm <laughs> React Advanced, and I scaled down my involvement with the React Native uh, core team. I'm still helping around, but I'm mostly trying to help my local community of open source maintainers through a meetup called Provided As Is. And if you want to learn more, uh, we can talk it separately. Uh, but basically, the true change that happened between May and now is actually that I removed Twitter from my mobile phone, and believe it or not, it made my life so much better. Anyway, as Yanni already mentioned, I'm Lorenzo, I'm at Calset Everywhere, where I want to be found. Uh, I've been a React Native developer for over three years now. I've been a core maintainer for almost two. It's gonna be in January, my maintainer birthday, month birthday, anyway. And I've also been working at Formidable since January. Um, Formidable is an awesome company. I'm having the time of my life, and we work with some great clients. If you have any kind of project that needs help or new project that needs to be kickstarted here in London or in Seattle, Phoenix, Denver, US, everywhere, uh, feel free to reach out to me or to my colleagues. We also have a booth in the other room, so there's that. And also, we are hiring, so you know, it's really a great company to be in. And you may want to, you know, think about, think about the idea of joining us. But anyway, talking about React Native, when I think about the way the project came to be, for some reason, my brain, mostly because, you know, thanks Disney, uh, I just always think about this scene from Hercules, where Zeus takes things from different clouds and makes the Pegasus. And I can help by feeling that basically that's what happened with React Native. You see, in 2013, uh, what the scenario was inside Facebook, or that's my imagination going for it, it's like on one side they had React, on the other side they had the you know, native apps, and basically on one side they had a web-based technology, they had JSX, and it was a technology that was fast to iterate in. It was, you know, I like the way JSX works, so it was also like appealing from you know, a coding perspective. And on the other side, you have native, which means proprietary stacks like Android and iOS, which are completely disjoint, like you need to write everything twice, and also is slow to iterate on. Like if any of you has ever done like an iOS release, like a proper Apple review process, iOS release, you know that. Now it, it got better, it's like 24 to 48 hours, but back in like even two years ago, it was like you could hope to take like three to five days, like it was really, really painful, like between when you wanted to launch something and when it was actually released to your consumers. So basically the team in 2013 started thinking with the idea, and then in 2015 they were like, okay, how about we take JavaScript, we put it in a thread, we take the native app, we have the, the native side in its own dedicated thread, and then through a custom bundler, we kind of force our code into a native app. Well, that 
made kind of sense, right? You have two threads. One, it's JavaScript, so it means that even if JavaScript screws up really, really badly, it's still in its own thread. And also, like, iOS already provided the JavaScript core, which is an engine uh, based on WebKit or the other way around, but still, you already had for free the place where you could put this bundled JavaScript. And that's great. The only thing missing at that point was a bridge or was some way to make these two <coughs> sites communicate. And that's why they selected JSON as the data format because it's quite you know, open and universal. And then they created this interface called the bridge, which is actually more of a queue. Uh, it's, it has good and bad things about it, and I'm going to mention the limitations of it later. But the core idea is that now you have something that can make the two sides communicate through a common format, which is really, really important. Also, this bridge, because this idea was so uh, embedded into this approach, when you started your app, it means that the bridge is starting. So like, it's really, really intertwined with the life cycle of any React Native app. And at that point, well, you may say, you know, we're ready to go. You know, we have the messages that are batched. They are sent back and forth. It's an async queue, so you have communication going all the time. But there is actually one thing that is missing. That is basically the possibility to use flex Flexbox. That's because uh, native uh, implementations don't have Flexbox by default, so they needed to take you know, from another cloud, from uh, another Facebook project called Yoga, which is a layout engine. They had to take it, integrate it into the, this idea that they were shaping up, and now we have the full structure. Basically, um, we have Yoga, which is implemented in C++, in its own dedicated thread, so basically every React Native app currently has three threads, and even if the bridge is one and all the messages are going back and forth, Whenever something is related to the UI, to the shape of the tree, uh, what you may have you know, heard through you know, React, because it's the same basic implementation, you have to go through the UI manager module to Yoga and then back to the native. So quite a, a number of jumps. So this is the full architecture. Now let's try to clean it up a bit, and let's talk about the main trade-offs. Ah. Oh, this is going to be long. No, I'm joking. Um, I've only written here like the main limitations that the current architecture has. Um, basically, as you can see, uh, a lot of them are around the nature of the bridge, because as you can imagine, like having one bridge which is fully sync means that the two realms don't actually know about each other. Like it's like imagining to talk to another person through frog to a, through fog by sending paper planes. Like you just send them and that maybe at some point something will come back, but you have no real insurance. And also, since it's just one bridge, one queue, with everything, it's easy to have a bottleneck. It's easy to have problems of clogging your bridge with too many messages and making them things slowly, uh, you know, perform slightly worse. And also, for example, for the native modules, so think Bluetooth, uh, the fact that you don't have this real awareness between the two sides implies that you don't know when you actually need something, so you need to load everything ahead of time. You're like, oh, I have only one screen, which is like five screens deep that uses Bluetooth. Doesn't matter, you still need to load it ahead of time, which means lower uh, startup times. Well, higher startup times, which means lower performances, sorry. Also, the JSC, a great idea because iOS provides it for free. Well, not really, because on Android, since that implementation was really tied to JavaScript core, you need to bundle it in. So your native app also comes with its own launch box with inside as the JavaScript core. And that, for example, led to a really annoying issue, which is that it was bundled, and it was a version that was there by around 2016, and then for like three years it stayed the same version, even if JSC per se evolved and improved. Uh, that requires some community help to get it back on track. And also, uh, as I mentioned, like there are multiple bounces that you need to have to provide the native UIs, and that means the JavaScript, again, because of the bridge, doesn't really have real control over, these thre over the three, basically. And the Facebook team is not like, it's not aware of this problem. Actually, they know and they've been working on this problem. And this is why we're going to talk about 
how they try to solve them all. And in particular, this is the future because it's still happening, it's not there yet, but uh, we'll get a bit more into it in a second. The key change of the new architecture and the key change from uh, what I just mentioned about the bridge is this new generic interface that the React native team decided to create called the JSI, which unsurprisingly means JavaScript interface. And basically what this interface allows is to have a direct interface between JavaScript and C++. And you may say, hey, hang on, why C++? Aren't we talking about Java or Objective-C? Well, yes, but what you may, while in Objective-C it's quite easy to see that <laughs> there is a connection. Uh, in fact, it's like only a super type, I think it's called, of C. So it's quite easy to uh, see the configuration and like the connection between the two. In Java, what you may not be aware of is that Android actually already translates all its Java code through the JNI into C++. So basically, you're already doing something that um, Android knows about. And also, this is really, really interesting because not only uh, it's it broadens the platform targets because, for example, I've written here like three question marks, but for example, last year I heard that some people were even thinking about, you know, targeting the Nintendo Switch because now you have the power of C++ in your hands. Like you can even directly just create some C++ files and use them in your React Native app. And this is all possible because in the JSI in particular, there's this method called host object and it allows for shared ownership of whatever object, whatever shape that you may have. And also, another easy thing, easy thing that uh, this allows is basically to swap the engine. And this, uh, we'll see in a bit, can create quite a few uh, easy wins for our code base. But this is the key change. On top of this, they've decided to basically work on the re-architectures in three waves. The first wave is the native modules, which you may have heard of as Turbo modules. At React Native Europe, they called them native modules, but then yesterday, Tom Aquino called them Turbo modules again. So those things, uh, it's basically the new implementation for the native modules. As I mentioned previously, uh, the native modules had this weird quirk, which is we didn't know what we needed when, so we needed to load everything up front. Now, since we have this direct reference, we know when we need something, we only load the module when we actually need it. And this is a massive improvement in, in the startup time. And also, each method of then that module being loaded can be called synchronously, so we don't need to wait for callbacks through the JSON bridge. And this is really, really incredibly good for performances. And the next phase, which is a similar approach for the native UI is actually called the re-renderer, uh, renderer, which is Fabric, which Fabric is not the older architecture, it's only the UI side, but now it's called re-renderer. But again, Tom Aquino called it Fabric, so one of those names. And basically it's the same core concept of like, now we have shared ownership, everything knows what's happening, and this implies also that the shadow tree is now full C++ because again, yoga, and it's also owned by both sides. This implies one thing in particular, which is that now we have opt-in synchronous um, execution because, for example, you know how when you scroll in a list, for example, in uh, React Native, one of the easy way of saying, ha, oh, this is not performance, performant, you just take an app, you just scroll really, really fast, which is not something that your user will do, but hey. Anyway, you just scroll really, really fast and you will see some blank spots sometimes, just for a millisecond, but you will see those blank spots. And that's because, basically the bridge. You need to go back and forth between the two sides to know what you need to show. Now, you can opt in and say, no, this is super, super important to have right away, so you can have those, you will not see anymore those blank, blank spots, basically. And one thing in particular, because it was mentioned yesterday during the keynote presentation at ReactConf, is that this is possible through React Concurrent, which is something that was basically already announced a while ago, but now there's some official documentation that you can read. 
the core concept there is that now React is aware of the concept of prioritization. So we will be able to have four different queues. We will have synchronous, synchronous bundled, asynchronous, and asynchronous bundled. And through those four queues, you'll be able to more efficiently show your user the right interface at any given point. There's also one thing that I don't want to really have in the slides, but it's around the concept of the C++ shadow tree. Basically, if you were here this morning and saw another's slides, uh, one of the talks that was given during uh, the Amazon internal conference was from sharing, and it was about the holistic view, uh, the holistic view of Facebook towards the shadow tree or something like that. And basically, I've only heard through rumors, but the core idea behind that is that this new shadow tree will be more performant than native UIs, potentially, which is interesting because it means that at that point, React Native Apps will be even better than pure native apps. It's incredibly interesting. But again, let's just keep it between us. No one else is watching aside from my mother. Hi, mom. But so we can just give it between ourselves. And the third phase, actually, um, as I mentioned earlier, like the bridge is really uh, intertwined with the React Native lifecycle, so it cannot be removed straight away. Also, because this upgrade process wants to be retro compatible, so it's not like at some point you will need to rewrite your whole app. It will happen gradually. You will not probably need to touch too much of your actual code because it's happening below the surface but the bridge will need to stay there for a while. So the third phase of the user architecture, which is all about the initialization, will be the one where the bridge will actually disappear. And not only that, like it's so incredible that the JSI can do so many things, but it's, it's, it's basically like a superpower. Okay, so you know how I said, okay, uh, JavaScript now can do this, this, and that, but one of the, Super interesting thing that can happen now is that since you have C++ code and C++ is strongly typed, you're kind of forcing your JavaScript code to be typed. And why is that? Well, uh, of course, because you need to have these interfaces. And since uh, the JSI itself is written in C++, there's no way, you cannot write any's anywhere, basically. You're gonna be forced to write proper types. And in particular, once you have your types, since you don't want to write manually their C++ counterpart, uh, the Facebook team decided to create a dedicated tool called the CodeGen. And what this CodeGen tool does is basically creating some interfaces for you, and now, since they are generated and they're in C++, we basically also can trust the data that are being sent. Because if you think about it, since in the current implementation, we have the bridge where all these JSON messages are batched together. You also need to kind of check that those, you know, data that are being passed, that once they reach the other side, they're actually the ones that you want. But now, if you have generated interfaces, there's no human interaction. So basically, magically, you will already uh, have a stronger code base, a less crash-prone code base. Uh, in particular, about the code gen, because maybe some of you are thinking, yeah, of course, it's only going to work with flow. Not really, because luckily the process itself is going to be modular, which means that it's going to have, your, you know, it's going to start from your typed uh, JavaScript. There's going to be a parser. That parser will then confront itself with a schema and then generate your interfaces. And you can rep you can basically swap the parser. Like, uh, of course, Facebook is working on the one for flow, but uh, Alexei Kuriv. Uh, worked on an early implementation for the TypeScript one, so you can keep using your TypeScript. And now, also, I think that basically he left that project because Microsoft is writing like the better version of that. And also, one interesting thing about this new tool is that since it's a, it's literally a CLI. You can run, you know, code gen run or whatever command it is. You can find it in the main code base. But the idea is that you can use it also to infer how your code has changed lately. Let's say, for example, you run that on CI. You can automatically tell if that code, if that update that you've done, that PR, that series of PRs, is actually an over-the-air update, or you need a native release. Like, you could have your CI decide, okay, this is code pushable. I can use code push now. 
for this without having you to manually, you know, remember if that time you didn't change any native code. Like this can be done automatically now, which is super, super interesting. So here it is. This is the new architecture complete. Hopefully there will not be many more changes from this current shape. Uh, and let's kind of compare it from the old one. Well, we've removed the bridge, which is awesome because it means that now we have native interoperability. We have a faster startup time because, again, we're not loading upfront everything that we may need at any point in the app, but we will actually only require it when, actually, when needed. This, of course, will lead to better memory management. Also, because you don't have you know, a bridge full of JavaScript and messages, you will have you know, mostly C++ proper code, basically. So better memory management. Again, typed code base, so let's crush, less crashes, hopefully. Also, you have the generated interfaces, so overall the code will be more stable. And this new series of tools will also improve your developer experience and will make you faster and quicker, as Omir was mentioning earlier this morning. You want to be fast, you want to do releases, you don't want to care about uh, other things, basically. I'm pretty sure now you're all quite excited, as I am. Um, here's the official roadmap. You have to think two things before reading the dates here. First one, it's meant to be retrocompatible, so it's harder. Basically, basically, they're trying to make their life harder so that everyone can benefit from it. And also, this is all happening in the open source repo, in the main one, so Facebook slash React Native. Uh, so you can also check the code for yourself. It's mostly all of it is already there, at least the turbo modules and fabric stuff is. JSI is basically already fully available. Um, I think I've put the link earlier, but basically the JSI in particular, there's a file which is like the .h file, which is probably like 60% comments and 40% code. So if you want to learn more about it, I highly suggest you read that. Uh, the native modules or turbo modules as you prefer should roll out fully completed early 2020. Uh, Re-render fabric mid-2020, initialization should be late 2020. They didn't really announce any data on the code gen, so yeah, I am not sure, but surely it will probably happen mid-2020 if I have to take a guess, because turbo modules and fabric use it anyway, or even earlier than that, but, but it's in the code base anyway, so you can start using it if you want. And that brings me to the last section of my talk, and that didn't work, so I'm assuming I have like 10 to 15 minutes, something like that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, basically, as you may be aware, we're all gonna die one day. So, <laughs> as Professor used to say. And what can we do right away? What can we do now? Well, first thing first, uh, there are some low-hanging fruits, which you may have already done. If not, I highly recommend you take you you know take your time and. Do all of them. First off, you know, type the code base, use Flow or TypeScript, it's fine. As I mentioned, the code gen will be able to digest both of them anyway. Um, take advantage of Metro's configuration. Like, uh, for some reason, I couldn't really find the documentation anymore about this. But like, there are two flags in particular that you may have in your metro.config.js file. Uh, one of them is the inline requires. And basically, if you look to the code in Metro, what it means is that it will import an extra Babel plugin. And if you look in the code for that Babel uh, preset uh, plugin, sorry, you will see that basically what it does is that it takes every required that you may have on top of your file, and it actually puts it right where it's only needed. So that's a slight improvement over you know, getting all the stuff that you need only when you really need it. And the third thing is actually to, you know, you can do some benchmarking already with uh, a few tools here and there, but from React Native 62 in particular, you will be able to use the new React DevTools, which is like incredibly so much better. And to be honest, I think that right now, Brian, the HVOG is speaking at React Conf about it, so sorry, but like, if you, you know, go back in time 30 minutes, you can watch that instead. <laughs> And also there's Flipper, which is another tool the Facebook team has created for mobile benchmarking. Again, it will be more usable from 62, but there is a blog post by Ram about how to enable it in uh, you know, older versions of, I think, 60. Um, and I highly recommend you try to use it because it's really, really powerful. 
Another low-hanging fruit is Hermes. You may have already heard of it. It's basically a new JavaScript engine, highly optimized for React Native, as you can imagine, again, powered by the JSI. And the core idea here is that it's super optimizing on how the bundle is generated. So if for, if for a standard you know, a JavaScript engine, we only do a bundle, with Hermes, actually, it will kind of get in the way of when the bundle is created to pre-compile it. And that way, your startup time will be faster because the code itself will be much more efficient itself. But it's not something they can do you know, for all the engines. They've done it with Hermes. It's incredible. Like, if you want to take a look at the articles that are linked there, they're talking about you know, the actual benchmarking. And it's really, really easy to add to your code base. It's like a three-line change. Don't quote me on that, but it should be around that. And also, it will allow you to use Chrome de remote debugging, uh, which is really, really good. But because like right now, usually what happens is that if you do remote debugging in Chrome, it uses the Chrome V8 engine, which is not the same that will run in your apps. And that sometimes leads to problems. Um, another thing to mention is what has been called the Lint Core project. Uh, basically, this project has taken shape over a year now. And the idea is that some components that were in the main code base has been moved out so that they could be, first off, more easily maintained, also removed from the main you know, bundle so that if you're not using them, they will not be you know, that code in your bundle. Uh, there are already 25 repositories, like 25 components extracted. I'm pretty sure they're not done completely. Um, but yeah, this is a really cool and interesting project. I highly recommend, like, if you haven't done the migration yet to the new version of the components you may be already using, I highly recommend you do it because the new versions are actually so much better anyway. Like, for the web view, I don't know if you, um, you know, move to the new one. I think you should because there's like a yellow box that will appear if you don't, so you should do it. Um, but yeah, the link core is something where the community has been really, really involved. And talking about the community, uh, again, you may already know, uh, Yanni sort of mentioned it, how the community has always been part uh, of the development of React Native. Uh, in particular, there's this repository, which is the discussion and proposals, which is where most of these ideas are being discussed and commented, and like the link core started there. Um, and it, Basically, it's also the place where, in collaboration with the Facebook team, uh, like we have come up with a series of ideas and strategies and also tools like uh, Bob or the Circle CI Orb that are basically trying to make all the repositories and all our code bases, if you want to you know, use them, more um, you know, consistent, more stable. And also, like right now, we have this project called Tester, which has been uh, tackled by Bartol Kurza, I think his right name is, um, which basically is trying to get a tester inside every single repo so that it will test the code automatically against the main repo so that you will see ahead of time when something changes and breaks because that's another you know, uh, issue that you may have had in the past, like the upgrades you mentioned earlier this morning. Um, like the tester should help with that, for example. Uh, and also like, the community is behind some of the massive improvements that we had lately, like the upgrade helper, which is a web app where you can see all the changes that you need to do, and auto-linking. And if you're not using React 60 yet or 61, highly recommend you upgrade because auto-linking is so good. It removes so much stress from you know adding a new package. It's so more reliable. It's incredible. But also the community likes to experiment. So in particular about the new architecture, there's a dedicated discussion about Fabric, one about two modules, and in both of those you'll see people trying to use them already. So if you want to test them out, you can go through the comments, try, you know, tinker your app uh, against their comments, and see what happens. But again, highly experimental, try only if you want to have some, you know, legit fun and or multiple crashes that will make your life miserable. <laughs> Now, aside from those, I also wanted to give a shout out to, you know, to Kudo for doing uh, an awesome work about ben benchmarking all the different engines. Because again, through the JSI, we can now use any kind of engine. Uh, 
And you'd be surprised by the results. Like in this repo, he explains how he benchmarked. There are, there's a Google sheet with all the graphics that you can see. And I think that V8 surprisingly wins out of everything. It's incredible. But it, like, look into that if you are you know, the kind of uh, engine nerd. Uh, the last uh, thing I'm going to mention, uh, which is only about the JSI, it's basically um, a repo that has also two Medium posts attached to it from Eric and Christian. Uh, they've been trying to work to, to make a simple project using the JSI without relying on anything else. So if you want to try for yourself the JSI, you can try that repository, look at how the code is changed to, through the commits. Uh, also, the commits on master on that repo are only for the iOS version, but there's a pull request for the Android version. So you have both sides of the test implementation there. Anyway, closing up, as I mentioned, change is good. And if we had to you know, uh, do emojis <laughs> about this change, basically, this is what would happen. Uh, but you know, using actual words, the JSI, uh, I hope that I convinced you that it's probably the single most important new concept that has arrived in React Native, is the keystone of everything that you'll see happening, the main code base for the next year, at least. And, you know, both of these three phases will happen during 2020. They will massively improve our apps, and hopefully you will not have to even change your code to, for it. But at the same time, you shouldn't just sit around and wait and see what happens. You can be active participant in this process through Lincore, through everything else I mentioned earlier. And I really hope um, I'll see you more around. I'll see you be more active and try things out. Thank you for listening. It's been lovely seeing you the year. And I'll see you on the other stage later. Thank you.